So um, I'd like to introduce our final speaker, uh, Javier Zamora from JSM Organics. Javier is the owner of the JSM Organic brand and Triple M Ranch located in Royal Oaks, California. He farms over 100 acres on California's central coast. And that's quite amazing since he only started farming in 2012. Um, he studied at both Cabrillo College and went through the ALBA program. And now he's moved on to a mentor of many other farmers. And he's a leading voice in the local agriculture community on the board of many different organizations. Um, he arrived in the US in 1986, not even knowing English, uh, but he's persistent, intelligent, and adaptive. <laughs> uh, and he's created a thriving organic vegetable and berry business that serves as a role model for a lot of other small scale growers and people wanting to become small scale growers. So on Triple M Ranch, he has several vegetated practices. He has a riparian area, he has um, hedgerows, and he has uh, vegetated ditches. So for this reason, he's a good person to speak to how, how he manages these practices and how he sees them in the context of the food safety issue. Welcome, Javier. We're so glad you can join us today. Oh, thanks, Pam, and uh, thank you all for, uh, you know, taking a couple of hours of your daily routines to, uh, you know, collaborate with uh, with some of us farmers that we need your expertise. Can you guys all hear me well? Oh, Danny, yes. come on. It's so good to see you again, man. And I saw some of those pictures uh, uh, when you were doing the, the bird analysis of what's in their poop and all that good stuff. So um, as, as Pam mentioned, I mean, I, I really, obviously I don't have, oh, there is, Pam's got a couple of uh, uh, maps for me. So we're, we're located, you know, between Watsonville and Salinas, kind of Las, Las Lomas Ranch and, and the Triple M Ranch, which is now kind of my home ranch. It's, you know, for some of those that don't know it, I mean, it, it's a 200 acre ranch with, uh, you know, 60% is it's for conservation. So that means out of the 200, just 80, close to 80, 80 acres are farmable. So I am surrounded by mother nature. And I think that the most important thing that I could probably say is that, you know, we farmers are coming in into mother, into mother nature's land. I mean, it wasn't really ours. We're kind of like intruding. And we, so, so therefore, in our heads, we must work with what we have without really uh, destroying uh, some of the riparian areas that are definitely needed for birds and, 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 and other, uh, you know, raptors and, and other animals that have been here for a while, maybe many, 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 many years. So I think what I have found is that working alone with what Mother Nature has it actually is doable. And, and, and of course, if I just said that myself, you know, some of those people that believe that getting rid of, you know, anything that is green around your lettuce field will actually make you uh, more successful and the food will be safer. Um, in my case, I can tell you that not necessarily, is, that's, that's not the case, but again, I'm just me. Uh, so, uh, but in order to kind of like, uh, convince those people that work, that want to get rid of riparian areas and hedgerows and, and, you know, disturb mother nature, that's why I work with people like, you know, uh, Dr. Carp, and, uh, Pam, and Jasmine, and, and Sarah, and, and the RCDs. Uh, for them to conduct some of these studies and some of these research that it's actually, it's proven that when you work with Mother Nature alongside, things do okay. Uh, so far, I mean, it's been, you know, this is the sixth year that we're working at the Triple M and uh, uh, things are, are, are doing really well. As Pam said, we have, you know, 
back there, we have obviously the lettuce fields. We have very beautiful hedgerows and very diversified fields, you can see. Um, if we go to the other side, we have, you know, some tunnels of blackberries, raspberries and things. So that's kind of what I've done is just, you know, try to uh, improve uh, what's around, maintain the hedgerows, create some new ones, uh, and then uh, kind of provide maybe even some shelter for birds. In this case, we're, you know, we have some boxes for birds. We have some uh, owl boxes and, and uh, you know, things of that sort that can actually in, uh, provide a, a, a shelter uh, for these animals that have been around for a while. Um, I, I don't know much. I mean, I don't want to take a lot of time, but I'm sure some of you might have some questions. So um, I, I believe that uh, working with what we have and connecting with uh, some of the you researchers and some people that have better brains than mine um, may, you know, help you uh, do better, uh, producing really good food and, and keeping our environment uh, safer, clean, and uh, providing a a uh, a better future for uh, future generations as well. Thank you, Javier. Um, I love your philosophy. <laughs> uh, that that seems like a a great way to help the future um, through trying to to harmonize with nature and and. Uh, figure out how to feed ourselves at the same time. And um, so I, I did have a question for you, Javier. You uh, told me that you recently had a surprise FISMA audit. And when the auditors went through your land, um, did they have any concerns with the vegetated practices that are there? No, I mean, absolutely not. I mean, they they came in, they spent probably four and a half, five hours here, um, went through the normal stuff, all our records or all our uh, inputs, um, the traceability issues, and then we walk around the fields and they wanted to see uh, our crew pick strawberries, and they wanted to see our crew pick the vegetables, and and see what what the place looked like, and and they saw the riparian areas that are nicely maintained. Uh, you know, you can clearly see what what Mother Nature is, and you can clearly see where the definition of the fields. And and absolutely not, they didn't they didn't say anything like why are you uh, clearing those weeds back there or anything like that, because they can see that. You know, there's a lot of diversity, but it's clean, it's organized. And I, again, I, they did not mention anything like, like you, you must have some sort of, uh, you know, buffer zone, like, you know, 40 feet of, or 100 feet or no, no weeds or no shrubs around. Um, the guy was not, I mean, the inspector wasn't like someone that had just started working. It was, uh, you know, an old timer. So they really had a, a very open mind on, on, on where the farm is located and, and, and how well and how organized it is. So I did not have any issues at all. Great. That, that's good. I'm glad they, they were happy with the way it's being done there with the vegetation. Um, so another question I have for you is, I know that through the CDFA Healthy Soils Program grant, you recently installed nearly a, a thousand feet of hedgerows. Why did you decide to do that? And have you seen benefits from them? And have you seen any crop damage or other uh, food safety concerns? Well, they're, they're, it's actually, it's gonna be, we're gonna be finishing this year and it will be 4,300 square feet. Uh, it's, if you look at this field there, and it goes all the way down, it's actually a 12 acre 
piece of land. So what I did is there is a, a riparian, you know, willow, um, just a bunch of native trees or whatever is around the, uh, the Carneros Creek uh, natural habitat. And I, what I wanted to do is kind of like create a little buffer zone uh, between that and my field. So uh, the way to do that, what we did, we created a ditch all along the field um, and a berm, and we put a, a, a hedge row on top of the berm. And, and that way we could see, kind of like I have a little uh, pier or like a little, uh, just a different type of vegetation between that riparian and the field. So, so I got together with obviously uh, uh, Sam, Sam Earnshaw and, and, and uh, even you, uh, Pam, and, and, and uh, Laura Murphy. And we, we uh, put a, put a, uh, a, a list of plants that will create, uh, that were natives, that will create a flowering environment for different species of insects and uh, a, a different look, kind of like a step down from the riparian willow area and, the, and our field. And what I have seen is that, first of all, I don't really have uh, any water from the creek flooding my field anymore. Uh, once the uh, coyote bush gets, you know, to six, seven feet, it's also going to provide a shelter for uh, some other species. And uh, the quail bush will provide a, 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 a shelter for quails and, and, and other birds. I, I have not had anybody, anyone like you, do a research and see if there is what the impact would be. Um, so that is... Uh, that is yet to be seen, but um, I'm really hoping that uh, uh, some of you will come in one day and do a little research about that, what the impact is. What I do see so far is, is just a, an, a, a greater area for the, the birds and the insects to do their thing, and, uh, and a lot of uh, more diversity in flowers uh, that will allow the insects to stay uh, closer to the farm or a shelter if they need to go away from the farm. Thank you, Javier. So now I'm going to um, open it up to questions for all the different speakers that we've had uh, present in the webinar. And I have a couple still left over from before. Um, so one of um, the questions uh, is for you, Danny. And it says, uh, look, you did a lot of work on adjacent non-crop habitat. Did you ever look at any other types of crops like grapes or tomatoes and see if having just more diversity but not necessarily non-crop diversity, um, did you ever look at the effects of those uh, on food safety and on other, and, and on benefits? Yeah. Um I would say it's been a little bit less of our focus. We've looked at things like um, how much diversity there is on the farm in terms of numbers of crops or in the surrounding landscape in terms of numbers of crops. Um, I never like call out and say exactly which farmers I'm working with because I'm never sure which ones would want to have it disclosed. But now that Javier self identified himself, we've done a lot of work with Javier and, and some of the like great pictures that we have of like good examples of vegetation around the farm is is from his ranches. Um, and he, he's like a great example of where you can get a lot of, he just grows an extraordinary number of crops often. And so um, we've looked at the impacts of that um, and haven't really seen much. There's been certainly no negative impacts of having crop diversity on food safety. Um, and in terms of like, the drivers of the bird communities and other things like that, the non-crop vegetation has been way more important, I can say, um, than, than crop diversity, but there's plenty of other studies out there that's showing crop diversity is really beneficial in terms of pest regulation and pollination and a bunch of other things um, beyond what I do. But yeah, no, I, I haven't really focused on specifics of like whether this farm is next to like grapes or, or tomatoes or something. Might be interesting looking forward. Okay, great. 
Um, here's another question, in, and it's, um, why do you think it's so difficult to get the food safety decision makers, those setting the standards for the practices um, and bare ground buffers and such, why is it so hard to get them, why does it seem hard to get them into the room to, to tell about this message? Well, I'll bet you there's a lot more people in this call that would be better to answer that than I would be. Um, you know, I, I've heard a lot of speculation about things, um, about why it might be. Uh, on some level, we might just be not doing it right. I mean, I, I will be the first to confess that scientists aren't often the best outreach and communicators in the world. Um, so, you know, we might not be doing our jobs right and would love always recommendations of how we could do it better in terms of getting this, this work out there. Um, another thing I've heard some, and I don't know that this is true, this is just like through the grapevine, is that I know that um, there are some big organizations that actually compete over their food safety standards. Um, and so they, because of that, want them to be um, private and opaque. And so they wouldn't necessarily want to come to the room and, and share what they're doing um, or make their presence be known for that reason. So I, I've heard that as, as a reason um, as well. But yeah, I, I, I'll turn that over to other people that probably would know that way better than I do. Well, thanks for giving it your best shot. Um, I, I appreciate your answering it. And anybody who's on this call who has <laughs> some ideas there, I think you know there, a lot of us would like to have answers to that question. So if you can email your suggestions to me, um, then, then, uh, then we'll have a better idea there and maybe we can find ways to, to better approach that group because obviously they really wanna, wanna keep food safe for the consumers. Uh, so thank you everybody for attending the webinar. Thank you to all the speakers for all the great work that you're doing and thank you for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. And uh, there will be a very short, um, evaluation coming out. If you could take a, just a couple minutes to answer that, that'd be appreciated. And I will put, uh, I'll send everybody emails with the links uh, that Paula provided in her, um, in her presentation. I'll make sure you all receive those informational links. And if anybody else wants to share links, please also email me um, your links as well. So thanks everybody, and I'm sorry we didn't get to a couple of the questions, but if you um, if you email me those two, I can make sure that the presenters get back to you. All right, have a good rest of your day and take care. Adios, amigos. <laughs>